Hey everybody, this video is going to cover the first lecture from my natural language processing class in Python. I recorded this the day of, but managed to have a terrible recording and the video didn't sound right, so we're doing this again. <clears throat> I will tell you I have a bit of a cold, so please ignore all the cold noises. <laughs> um, but I'm going to cover the first kind of lecture material for uh, the first chapter of the natural language processing book. And then a little while later, I will also go over the lecture slides that cover the Python part of the first chapter from an LTK. So here we go. All right. So what is this course about? Well, the course, uh, if you're watching along with this, if you're in the class, you'll know this, is a natural language processing course, uh, specifically with the Python NLTK toolkit. Now, the course is listed as sentiment analytics, but that is a part of the more global natural language processing, so it really should be called NLP. Okay. We're also going to cover some computational linguistics because that's kind of a term that that um, maps onto, onto these topics. And really that's my area of expertise. And so we're just gonna do um, linguistics through the lens of computer science, which is what computational linguistics is. And we're also gonna deal with language. Language is super messy. So if we think about the way that language is structured, so it can be spoken, it can be written, it can be visual, if you're thinking about um, sign language, and then the way that we talk, the way we write is not the same, and like, it's just a lot of different interesting things that go on with language, never mind even covering the differences between languages. So this course will really help you understand that problem, as well as how to analyze linguistic data. So what are you gonna learn? These are the course objectives from my course. So how simple programs, we'll see how we feel if they're simple at the end of the semester, can help you manipulate and analyze language. So, and we'll also learn how to write these. So this is a, a coding course as well as a, um, a learning course. So it's kind of a learn by doing. Um, how concepts from text mining, where we can pull data from lots of places and linguistics are used to analyze data. So the, the growth of the internet and freely available corpora, which is large bodies of text, have really made this an ex area of explosion in terms of research and business practice. And so how those ideas can be used to analyze language. How data structures and algorithms are used in NLP. So just like basically the coding stuff, how do we actually take this mess of data and make it understandable and basically how language data is stored so what is a corpus how is that stored how do we do part of speech tagging what what do we how do we measure lemmas so we'll get into topics of stimming and figuring out the best way to deal with language data and then how we can evaluate our techniques on maybe let's say sentiment tagging so um this will go into a bunch of different topics, but basically we'll cover the NLTK book. So the syllabus for my actual peoples and course stuff you should read um, because syllabi are important. It covers all the important information about um, what's required for you. And that's covered more in actual lecture. Um, our course uses Moodle for everything course related as part of school policy and then um, if you're part of the course, you should go check those things out. Now, I will save my rest of my YouTube channel from having to listen to that blah, blah, blah. Um, but if you are one of my students, please uh, ask questions on our course discussion board or email me if you have more concerns. Okay, part of this course and part of everything I try to do is really creating reports. So there's often a disconnect between the people who run the analyses and the people who, under, who need the answer. And so we will be writing reports with Jupyter Notebooks where the code and the text are embedded together. Now, if I was writing a report for a business person, I might not put my code in there, but you can always learn how to hide those things. But for scientific reports, it's kind of nice to have the code embedded with the text. 
I'm a big, big proponent of Markdown and using Markdown. I use R Markdown to write my manuscripts for my research and I'm learning how to use Jupyter Notebook along with everyone else on this channel um, <clears throat> to do the same thing. So this will allow you to run code and interpret it in line together and present that information together. And so you'll be expected to write those reports and you'll see me using those reports to pre present information to you. And so we'll just have to cite the sources that we're referencing. So if you pull a corpus from somewhere or you're using a um, article cited from the book or an article you've read, you'll want to reference it. I'm a psychologist, don't tell anyone. Um, not that kind of psychologist, I'm a statistician. And, but still APA style. If you're not familiar with APA style, you can search Purdue's OWL website, which is really fantastic for reports and for citations. Uh, we're not really going to write traditional research reports, um, but if you want to cite something, use APA. Okay, you can also look up Knight Cite. That's knight, like knight in shining armor cite, and they have a really good template tutorial for APA style. So getting into the meat of the course, what is natural language processing? So what is NLP? I feel like it's gained this like aura of like, woo, because if you had asked me even six months ago, um, do you do NLP? I'd be like, oh, hell no. <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm a god do computational linguistics. I do like traditional psychology studies, but it's really not that different. And so it stands for natural language processing. But natural here, we mean mostly human language. So not animal language, not computer language, <clears throat> because computer languages could be studied, but we're talking about like English, Spanish, um, oh gosh, any, any of the like 7,000 plus languages that exist, right? Um, it has roots in computer science, uh, artificial intelligence and linguistics. It's really a mishmash of a bunch of different cognitive science fields like psychology, linguistics, um, artificial intelligence is one of the big places that I would say this started and we really wouldn't be here without computers because then we wouldn't have the ability to share or analyze this data very well. And so it's <clears throat> kind of an amalgamation of a bunch of different fields and it focuses on human language and how to analyze that type of language data. So what is language anyway? What do we mean when we say language? And so uh, Simon and Newell really kind of put this, I can't remember if it's Simon or Newell or both on it, uh, to be fair, but I think it was Simon. So we argued that humans especially are uh, intelligent symbol systems. And so perceptual processing systems. So it's, it's all about the symbols. So language is a collection of symbols. And when you start to think about it that way, then we can analyze these collections of symbols in a bunch of different ways, depending on how we want to break those up. So those symbols might be, might be visual. Um, they might be like what we think about as literal words, phonemes, morphemes. And so it's a, a way for us to, to reconceptualize what is generally thought of as qualitative data into quantitative data. And really, it's, I say it's messy because it doesn't tend to follow structure. So when we measure, let's say, teacher evaluations at the end of the year, that is, uh, well, while also messy, is structured, right? So we know the scale ranges from one to five. And we can argue all day on whether that scale is or no, meaning it's ranked, or if it's more interval, meaning there are you know, equal measurements between each time point. But then when you think about language, I mean, this is the third time I've given this lecture and it's totally different. So how do we deal with the fact that the meaning it maybe is the same, but the actual content is not? Okay, so just an example of how language can be messy. Oh, another example I thought of as I was um, driving home from giving this lecture was like, how do we deal with the fact that um, English is a stupid language where things like butt dial and booty call mean totally different things idiomatically when we use them, but semantically those words um, are generally considered equal in meaning. Right? So that's what I mean by messy. Okay, so some basic origins here. 
Um, so the Turing test, Alan Turing, brilliant man, um, developed this idea, um, which has now spawned into competitions of the Turing test. And so what it is, is that you have, would have a conversation. So you would say something or type something, and then the response would come back to you. And your job is to judge if that response is from a human or from a computer. Okay, so if you want to play around with this clever bot website, um, has some of these intelligent systems. If you're old enough to remember AOL Instant Messenger, like the smarter trial days, um, and so we're tr or those um, oper automated systems when you call uh, on the phone and you're trying to get to an operator, right? And they don't understand Southern twang very well, which I totally have being from Texas, and they certainly don't understand Southern twang with a cold. And so um, obviously these systems aren't very good so far, <clears throat> right? So this is around the 1950s and the test said that if over half of the judges thought that the responses were from a human, then this computer would pass the Turing test and we would have an intelligent system. There's the Chinese thought room experiment by Searle in the 80s that essentially was kind of similar to the Turing test in that if we were passing um, notes through a hole in the wall and one of those um, people talking was actually a computer, but the person they were talking to thought it was a real person, does that make it intelligent? So if you knew it was a computer, but you thought it was a person, does it actually make that computer intelligent? And so it's thinking about what does it actually mean when we say intelligence and smart systems, right? Um, but back to the 1950s, a Georgetown experiment. This was one of the first demonstrations of machine translation. I think it was Russian, where they were inputting sentences and getting English back. If you've ever played with the Google fails, Google Translate fails, you'll know that this is still not a perfect system. And then there's the game where you can translate from one language to another, to another, to another, back to the original language to see the game of telephone, meaning how different it is from the original. <clears throat> but machine translation is a very large part of um, NLP. Uh, it's really important given the globalization of, of culture and the ability to communicate with people who don't speak our own languages. Um, NLP systems really start in the 1960s with these big two, Eliza being one of the largest ones. And I would say now one of the, the most well-known one of these systems is Watson, IBM's Watson. But then we also have... Um, Oops, I thought Siri and Google were on here, but we also have things like Siri and Google that are now um, automated language systems. Right? And there's really been an explosion in the research in this area and implementation, if you're not a science person, <clears throat> in business, um, given that we have much more computational power. So, you know, you are, we're talking about, we have machine, you know, tiny machines that have the power of what used to be um, a machine that was as large as a building or these, you know, my MacBook that I'm broadcasting this on has more power on it than what got the spaceship to the moon. And so uh, as computation power increases, um, we have more power to do things as corpus linguistics has really exploded with the availability of text on the internet, machine learning. So all of these things getting better and better as we go has really moved this field to being one of the most well-desired traits um, that maybe a business person would need <clears throat> uh, as a data scientist. So why study this other than money, right? So you can uh, get a job. Um, this is from the book, but it says 80% of big data is unstructured data. So like just data on the internet, right? Um, so there are images, there's videos, there's like lots of text recordings like this one. Um, and how do we deal with that? Right? So we could do lots of text mining. So this is sometimes called text analytics or sentiment analysis. Um, it just kind of depends on what the question is here, if it's sentiment or not. Right, so we're talking about semantics. Um, and so being able to find the data and process the data um, 
really allows you to do to answer some interesting questions. Okay. And so we can use linguistics, statistical, and machine learning techniques to pull high quality information from text. So we might do auto classifiers to tell you what type of text this is, topics analysis, um, or even your basic statistical techniques like ANOVA. So there are lots of things that we can apply to linguistic or natural language data. So some traditional approaches to text analytics, this would be kind of where I would have placed myself until recently, um, is semantics. So my research is really focused on like, how do we know what words mean? And how do we know that people know that words mean the same thing? Um, and how do, you know, like, how do we know that people think of cats and dogs in the same way? Uh, and the best way to measure those sorts of things. But what traditionally people have thought about is readability. So uh, looking at like the reading levels for a text and um, classifying how understandable a text is and then student interest indices. Now, <clears throat> by this, I think traditionally we're talking about you know, grade school children reading, you know, uh, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. But now we can really think about this as ratings. And so there's a whole bunch of interesting things you can do with people's ratings, like let's say on Goodreads or on Netflix, and the algorithms that people use to suggest a new thing to you. So if you liked X, you might like Y. Um, and so those, those rating systems um, can help us understand people's behavior. And then vocabulary. So uh, especially in grade school, Pro, uh, thinking about vocabulary processing and semantics. Now I'd say that the, a lot of the techniques really rely on frequency. And so I joke with my class that if you don't know the answer to a question, the answer is frequency. So why do people learn things? Frequency, like how do we know how to pronounce these things? Frequency. So uh, word frequency, especially in linguistics, is a very large indicator of a lot of things. And it also is a um, very useful set of information um, for natural language processing. <clears throat> okay. So with that, we can look at factor and cluster analyses. Word clouds are based on frequency. And then we can think about frequency in a bunch of ways. So pages, chapters, words, phonemes, morphemes, syllables, letters. There are lots of ways to think about frequency. So I'm gonna give you some basic terms to know and things on websites that you can play with to uh, learn some of this stuff. And then in this next lecture, we'll talk about how to calculate these things. So first one is corpus. What is a corpus? Uh, corpus or multiple corpus, corpuses are called corpora. And it's a body of linguistic data. There are lots and lots of corpora on the internet in any language that you might desire especially in different forms of the same language. So um, <clears throat> I talked a little bit in the class when I actually lectured about how saying someone speaks Chinese is not very useful because there are many forms of Chinese. And so if you were wanting to work um, on studying Chinese, you might consider looking at just Mandarin, just Cantonese, or any of the sub-dialects in those areas. So um, there are corpora for that. So texts that you can use to train your models, um, let's say for um, uh, sentiment um, tagging, right? And so corpora are like other bread and butter in this area, which means that we need to know how to find them and how to use them. Okay. One of the more famous corpora for American English, uh, there are the subtitle projects, but um, a easily searchable one is the Corpus of Contemporary American English, or COCA. And so I just have an example here of how I've searched for the word cheese in COCA because most of my examples are based on food. And um, that hasn't changed <laughs> from my statistics videos to this. And so I can see that it's occurred about 24,000 times in COCA, which is kind of a lot for a basic level noun. Okay. If you go to this website, you can actually click within the word and see all of the context in which those appeared. And you can see the um, collocates, which is a word we'll get to in here in a second. Okay. So another important distinction that I actually struggle with sometimes is tokens and types. 
tokens. Uh, token can be defined as a word or it can be defined in a different way. Let's just say for right now that token is a word. Um, it's the total number of words in a text. So we could define tokens as morphemes instead, which are pieces of words. But let's say we just set this at the level of word because that's pretty common. It would be the total number of symbols. Types, however, would be the number of distinct tokens or unique tokens. And so um, that could tell us two different things. Okay. It um, allows us to create a frequency distribution, which is a list of all the unique tokens, which is again our types, and a count how many times they appear. So we have the um, <clears throat> number of total words in a text, the tokens, and then the number of types, right? And that will give you what's well, a good measure of lexical diversity. So that's the next slide. But this down here is our frequency distribution. This also follows ZIPF's, Z-I-P-F, law, which is that the most frequent word is twice as frequent as the next frequent word. It's three times as frequent as the next frequent word. So it's a um, power law distribution of word frequency such that the most frequent words are way more frequent than the least frequent words. So a dispersion plot is where we were repre represent the location of a specific token in a text. Um, and so we would have each one of these is a different text. So each layer is a different text. And we can look at across the text where those particular words occur. So in the book database, there is, um, or there are some examples of, <clears throat> uh, Con congressional speeches. So we might look at where the word American appears in these congressional speeches. Um, there might be presidential speeches actually, um, and see if people tend to use it more at the beginning or more at the end. So this allows us to look at sort of the distribution of where things appear in a, a particular text. It's called a dispersion plot. A collocate or collocation is a sequence of words that occur together often. So you could play with Google's Ngram viewer. If you just Google Ngram, you will get to this. They scan the Library of Congress and allow, um, have done some really cool analyses with that. If you um, Google, Google, Google Ngram and TED Talk is a really great one on things that you can learn from having the largest corpus. <laughs> Um, so many, many words and the things that some of the interesting things they were able to extract from that using sentiment analytics. <clears throat> okay. Now in the text, it talks about these as bigrams and trigrams, but really this is sort of, I think a better phrase for this is ingram and that's in words that occur together. So a bigram is two words, trigram is three words. Um, and people tend to stick to, to, <laughs> to less than four just because it gets super complicated. Um, but the nice thing about collocates is we can figure out <clears throat> why things are associated together. So a popular collocate might be peanut butter. Those tend to occur together more than one might expect. Um, and so that would be a frequent bigram. So how do we compute language? Like we've already talked about language is messy, right? So how do we create, take qualitative data and make it quantitative? Okay. So some basic statistics frequency. <laughs> So we can do a count of the characters, the words, and the sentences. Now this obviously depends on the, the, visual, the type of language here. Um, so English is Latin-based language, and so we, types of characters might be individual letters, but there are other more um, ideographic languages uh, like um, Chinese that each character means more than a letter. And so you'd have to figure out what kind of frequency piece you were interested in and what level you wanted to analyze. Okay. Lexical diversity, which is a percent of the types to tokens. So um, uniqueness, right? So texts that are not very diverse have lots of words, but they're mostly repeated. Texts that are very diverse ha may have lots of words, but they're all different words. <clears throat> so you'd find that a textbook has more lexical diversity than your normal reading book. Um, because the purpose of a textbook is to introduce lots of new concepts. 
Flexical diversion is the dispersion, not diversion, <laughs> dispersion. It's the position of the word tokens in the text. And um, another set of things that we can do, so sort of in the basic statistics here, <laughs> um, is word sense disambiguation. So this is where semantics comes in. And this is where we might uh, decide what word is intended. So psychologists have been doing this for a while. They like to do eye tracking studies. The man mowed the lawn with the lawnmower, right? Lawnmower is an expected word given the context of that sentence. If you instead have something like the man mowed the lawn with the um, with the scissors, like, okay, I can, I guess, cut the lawn with scissors, but that seems kind of silly. And then you might do another one with the broom. Okay, you don't mow lawns of brooms, so people get confused and they go back and if they're watching their eyeballs, they'll go back to the word lawnmower and then mowed, trying to understand what happened, <laughs> right? But if we want a machine to do this, what we might do <clears throat> is look at particular words. Um, so things like serve, right? So that's got three or four different um, contextual meanings. And then so things like plate as well. Um, I remember not di dish, not plate. <laughs> I have several meanings. And so this is one reason I like to talk about um, how English is a kind of a dumb language is that it's very idiomatic. And you'll hear me say this a lot, and I don't mean this in any particular way. It's just it helps people think about especially second language learners. So if you are trying to understand what's happening in English, it can often be very difficult because we talk mostly in idioms. Um, and so we're kind of a, um, a language that has some moments. So a very famous quote is that we drive on parkways and park in driveways. Um, I've already given you the example of butt dials and booty calls. And then there's lots of other like quirky grammar moments um, such as I walk, you walk, they walk, he walks. So the third person singular um, verb conjunctions. Uh, another example is the many to many problem for talking about spelling. So one phoneme has many spellings and one spelling might have many pronunciations. So English has a lot of these moments. And so um, one thing we can try to get computers to understand like people is uh, context. We could also use context clues to help us figure those out. And these are things that children learn how to do. So how do we teach machines how to do this? Okay. <clears throat> um, another issue is uh, anaphoric and cataphoric um, references. So pronoun resolution. So I, I always tell students who are writing formal papers to think about this because um, if you just say this is, uh, most people will look back in the previous sentence and there might be four nouns, so which one is? Um, so pronouns are things that refer to a noun, like I, you, this, they, their. Um, how do we help understand what that pronoun is referring to? So where is the, what noun does it refer to? Um, that noun can be called the antecedent, usually because it precedes it in the text However, that is always not the case, especially when we're speaking. We don't often, um, sometimes we use uh, ambiguous cues. So here's a couple of examples. The thieves stole the paintings. They were subsequently sold. So most of us, we use um, our understanding, semantic understanding of the word sold. You don't sell thieves. You probably sell paintings. Um, they were subsequently caught. Right. This one, you don't catch paintings, you catch thieves, so that makes sense. And then we have an ambiguous one that they were subsequently found. What was found? The thieves or the paintings? Right. So how do we um, resolve which, what they stands for? And we might generate some language output. So these are systems where we can answer questions. So if you've ever used um, websites that have the like little automated pop-up on the side, like for example, Ikea has one that will answer your questions and work you through an automated system before getting you to a person. Okay. So who sold the paintings in the, <clears throat> in the previous slide example? 
We can look at machine translation systems. So that's translating from one language to another. And really the, the progress in this area is amazing. I think those apps that you like hold over the signs um, when you're in a, maybe in a different area that's got different signage or foreign country to yourself um, that automatically translate in the app are so cool. That obviously this could cause a crisis. So there's some websites with some really interesting stories about how translations may have started international relations problems. And so clearly this is very important. Um, but if you search for Google Translate fails, you'll see some moments when it does, doesn't work so far. And then those spoken dialogue systems, and this is things like Siri, okay, Google. And so if we put this all together, this is from the textbook, but I think it's a really great picture that it, it illustrates how difficult and what an, an interesting job this is, um, is the entire system, sort of cognitive system for language. So we could think about speech analysis. So how do I do speech to text? Um, and so dealing with pronunciation and phonology, we could think about um, underlining, understanding morphology. So how do we know that cats with an S means plural? We think about syntax and grammar and parsing and this understanding of the mental lexicon. We can move up a step and think about semantics. This is where ambiguity and multiple shades of meaning become very important. And then we can think about how one might reason given previous text knowledge. And so that has the, 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 the first line, which really explains the kind of concept and then also what um, so the systems are doing. So this, this is like the language system It's so complicated. And yet most of us in our native language, at least, um, have do these things without thinking. And so that's one thing about our cognitive systems, our biology is that, um, we're pretty amazing symbol processors. And so how do we make computers do that too? And I, I'm not going straight into artificial intelligence, but I'm saying like, how do we even get a computer to recognize that the, you know, the word bear has three different meanings? That sort of thing. <clears throat> so some other examples of, <coughs> excuse me, some things we can do, textual entailment. So it's determining if a statement is true from a set of text. And so this might be handy, let's say if you're trying to write questions for a textbook. Um, so the people who write the textbooks don't often write the uh, uh, multiple choice. That's why they're so terrible. Um, but it might, maybe we could program a computer to find um, questions from for us. So if we give the text this input, can we then ask it if this hypothesis is correct or not? All right. So at this point in the lecture, we had people work on Python and looking at DataCamp's uh, website for Python. I'm gonna translate some of that into a Jupyter notebook and kind of walk through what they are trying to teach you. I will say that all of this is for educational purposes, so it is stolen from the Natural Language Processing Toolkit book, which is free and really fantastic and has way more notes than this. Um, and a lot of the learning how to Python I have um, <clears throat> modified or updated from Data Camp's Learning Python website or their um, which is also free. And then if you want even more tutorials, I would highly recommend DataCamp because they allow you to do interactive coding, which is the best way to learn how to code other than listening to me. Okay, so from here, you will learn how to do a little bit of Python, and then you'll learn a little bit on how to do some of this natural language stuff in Python.